Hello, DEFCON. Hi. I hope you enjoy your time here. We definitely do. It's actually our first time here at DEFCON, and thus we are very proud and excited to present to you our talk, Redefining V2G, how to use your vehicle as a game controller. So why do we need to redefine the acronym V2G? Just a few minutes. Oh. Um, well, let me tell you a story. Once upon a time, our professor told us we should do some research about V2G. And what he means by that is that we look at vehicle-to-grid communication, the communication between the car and the charge point, and also the back end and uh, even the power grid for um, bidirectional charging, for example. Well, that's, that's actually a pretty cool research topic, but um, do you know what's even cooler? Using your car as a game controller. So um, <laughs> that's why we developed this little project called Vehicle to Game. But before we get started with that, a short introduction um, of ourselves. My name is Tim. I'm a PhD student at Darmstadt University of Applied Sciences in Germany. And um, I mainly yeah, do automotive security. So um, also a lot of theoretical stuff. I look at protocols and standards and uh, do a formal analysis of these standards to see if they, um, if they meet certain security goals. Yeah, hello from my side too. I'm Janis. Uh, I'm also a PhD student at our small res automotive research group called a uh, ACSD, Automotive Security, uh, Automotive Cyber Security Darmstadt. It's located in Germany. Um, I've finished my master's at the end of the last year, and now I'm a PhD student about uh, resilience in the automotive topic, uh, but also for IT, IoT systems. Means uh, what happens if an ECU in a, a car breaks or is going to be compromised, how you can migrate functionality to another ECU and strengthen the, strengthen the safety inside the car by such a resilience concept. Our research group is also um, very focused on teaching. We have a lecture called automotive security and therefore we have uh, to motivate students of course and that's why we have created this motivating and uh, beginner-friendly talk uh, uh, and our project V2G to uh, get students excited and motivated about the topic of automotive research. Maybe the most important member of our research group is our research car. It's a Volkswagen ID3. It's an electric vehicle. Um, and since, of course, we are German, so we have to do research on the Volkswagen, I think. <laughs> Usually, the initial step of the automotive research, but also all other security research, is considering attack vectors. And that's what we have to do also for the automotive context. You can see there are various attacks, uh, attack, uh, it's a huge attack surface. Uh, first of all, you have long range attacks, you have short range attacks, but you have also physical attack possibilities. For the long-range attacks, for example, the cellular communication between the car and the back end of the, uh, of the OEM, for example, for over-the-air updates. In uh, newly upcoming cars, you have also the uh, V2X communication, communi cars communicating to each other about their location, about their speed. Uh, you have cars communicating with road signs um, to get a status about the allowed speed, for example, of this uh, uh, street section. You have short range attacks, class that's more or less classical cybersecurity, uh, considering Bluetooth, Wi Fi connection for your infotainment system mm, between the smartphone, for example, for playing via Apple CarPlay, for example, the uh, music on your car. And the maybe most interesting and car specific uh, attack vectors are these physical attacks. That's, uh, the, in, uh, that's the bus systems inside the car. There's uh, several of them, um, but we want to focus on two and we go into them a little bit uh, later uh, in detail because we need them for our V2G project, getting all information required for our game controller out of this car. 
So here you can see our two uh, main research cars. Uh, we are focused on electric vehicles. So on the left side, you can see our Volkswagen ID3. On the right side, you can see the Tesla Model 3. Um, we use them for practical research. Tim also introduced him as a theoretical researcher. I'm also more theoretical part, but you cannot do the whole time theoretical research. So you have to do uh, tinkering around with a car. It's also good for the motivation. Yeah, so there's a lot of information you just get when you look at the actual car because the manufacturers won't tell you. And also for students, it's quite cool to uh, do a research on the actual cars and um, projects. So we have equipped our cars with lots of techniques to get uh, information about them. And we show you in the following how we, do, uh, how we have done this. That's the back of the Volkswagen ID3. We've equipped this with lots of measurement techniques. On the right, you can see so-called vector boxes. They're from a German company called Vector. That's why we call them vector boxes. They're for capturing uh, different buses inside the car. And we have equipped the car in a way that we can get a holistic view over all relevant buses in this car. Um, on the left side, you, you can also see some uh, interesting parts more for the electrical engineers. Um, we have equipped the car uh, with uh, so-called LEM sensors. They are current measuring the sensors via induction. You can clip them on the high, uh, high voltage system uh, uh, wires to measure the current. <laughs> the idea behind this holistic view uh, between physical and uh, messages inside the car is to get uh, that we can compare those data and get um, and get correlations between the actual physical measurements and the uh, recorded, for example, canvas data. As I've already introduced from a theoretical way, there's also a practical attack surface, of course. On the left side, you, you can see uh, classical uh, ke uh, key fob attacks using an SDR. Um, maybe you, all of you have heard about the roll jam attack. You jam the signal of the key fob because it's uh, using a rolling code, and the owner of the car will press a second time, uh, and you have recorded both th signals, and you re uh, resend the older one because the car hasn't heard this already, uh, already, and so you have a newer one for the car, unlocking this in the future without the owner get any notice about this. In the mid, you can see uh, for automotive and tech, uh, classical tech surface also unsoldering uh, the, the chips where the firmware is located on because you have physical access to your car. If you own the car, uh, you can do anything you like with it, more or less. Um, so that's why we have unsoldered the EMMC uh, chip uh, to get in contact with the firmware. Uh, that's the, the same we've, we've done uh, with the key fob. Uh, you can see here there was uh, the memory chip. And maybe uh, another interesting part is that you then can directly connect with, here you can see such a vector box, to the internal buses of the car. Here you can see one uh, such a ECU. And we have connected those, uh, this box with, this, uh, with the CAN bus of the ECU controlling messages. But before we go, therefore, a little bit in, in detail, uh, how these mess messages look like, first we have to understand what this canvas actually is, how we, can we talk to, to those cars. For a game controller, we require, as I've already mentioned, information about spe uh, specific uh, actuators of the car. For example, the steering wheel. We want to trans later want to transfer the angle of the steering wheel to our virtual game controller. So we have to get this information out of the car. And this information is transferred via the CAN bus. The topology of uh, such a car is, uh, looks like follows. It's a very condensed view. It's a very simplified view of our Volkswagen ID3, where you can see there's a main gateway ECU and several domains. Uh, each domain consists of several other ECUs, and each of those domains is separated in a way that uh, cr uh, based on criticality of those functionality and the ECUs. For example, in the middle domain, you can see, in the drive domain, you can see 
and that's located the engine ECU, but also the brake ECU, they're all safety relevant. So they're very critical for the safety behavior of the car. On the left side, you can see a separated domain with less criticality for, uh, for example, the lights, uh, light controlling inside the car. The special uh, thing in this topology is that those domains are separated based on this gateway ECU. The gateway ECU is responsible for, uh, um, for shielding the inside of the car against the outside because, you know, uh, maybe you know this from, from combustion engine, the outside of the car is connected with a so-called OBD2 port. It's for diagnosis. Uh, if you bring your car uh, to a garage, they will plug there in. And you want to prevent that via the OBD2 port, everyone can read everything of the car. So that's why such a gateway ECU is introduced into this topo topology. But this strongly depends on the actual car you want to consider. That's just for the Volkswagen ID3 and the group of uh, vehicles from Volkswagen. Now we get a little bit into de detail about this CAN bus. The CAN bus was developed by Bosch in 1986. It's a dual wire twisted pair cable. And as I said before, it's a bus topology. What does, mean, uh, what does it mean? A bus topology means that the ECUs are connected to the same wire or twist, uh, wire pair. And all ECUs get the same state of information in the respective time frame. We have a, a frequency of this in this CAN bus, and all these in this information is distributed in this time frame to all uh, ECUs uh, connected to this CAN bus. It's also a multi-master protocol, means that all ECUs can send and receive uh, on demand, uh, and there's no master required to control them. No. Now we have the foundations how this CAN bus works. Now we get to get gain access to this physical CAN bus inside the car. Um, Maybe the most convenient way is to find a re just a repair manual or a wiring diagram of the car. Uh, they're usually available for garages. Uh, for Volkswagen, you can uh, get them online. If you, uh, if you claim you are a garage, then you can buy it. Um, uh, otherwise, you have to find it out by yourself. But this can become very, very hard. So we recommend having such a wiring diagram. Based on this wiring diagram, you can find a good uh, exposed position of the uh, of an interesting CAN bus uh, where you can connect uh, to. For example, here you can see the Tesla Model 3, uh, which is in the mid console of the car. There's, uh, there's one of uh, three CAN buses, which you can easily uh, open and uh, connect to uh, uh, ready to buy adapter. Uh, you can buy those adapters easily on eBay, for example. And then you get, can gain access to this CAN bus. If you don't want to destroy your car or altering this, uh, there are also less intrusive uh, techniques uh, uh, called uh, contactless CAN readers. They read CAN messages based on indu induction of the signal. And that's more or less, it looks like a crocodile. That's why uh, some products called CAN crocodile. You clamp the CAN wires, high and low, those dual wires, between the between the clamp of the, can, uh, of the contactless CAN reader, and you can read those messages. So you have uh, gained access to the physical layer. You have read those physical signals um, of the CAN uh, bus. Now you have to transfer them into software. And therefore, you need uh, such, an, uh, for, for the Raspberry Pi, for example, a CAN head, where those can physical CAN signals are interpreted and transferred to the kernel of the uh, Raspberry Pi. And there are also other options available, uh, which can uh, conveniently used, uh, where you can connect your CAN bus directly via USB to your PC. This also works for Windows, so maybe it's uh, for part of you interesting. So now we have transferred the message to the, the software part of our project, and that's where Tim continues. All right. So uh, very conveniently in the Linux kernel, there's already a CAN driver built in. And uh, um, if you want to work with that, there's CAN utils, which has all the basic tools um, to, to use that. Um, also, if you are, want to, to do more advanced stuff for scripting, you can use 
for example, Python can is a really good library. That's what we use for our project. Um, there's also can tools for more advanced command line tools. Um, if you're into GUIs, there is SeviCAN, which is a really good open source uh, GUI tool. Um, and of course, there are a lot of commercial tools. We talked about all this vector stuff before. Um, but let's stick with the very basics. So you install canutils, and then they're very, like, there's this can dump demand, uh, command, which will just print all out all of the can messages on the bus. It looks somehow like this, but probably a lot faster if you're on a real car. So um, for Tesla, for example, it might be on one bus, it's, I think, like 3,000 uh, messages a second. So it can be quite a lot. Um, one step back, even um, if you connect to this, um, um, so for Linux, it's um, a CAN interface is like any other network interface if your adapter is uh, compatible with socket CAN. So um, the only difference is that like, you, you don't have network manager to directly um, get your um, interface up and running, so, and you also need a bitrate. Um, so you have to tell the, bus, uh, the, bu uh, how, um, the computer how fast the bus uh, operates. And um, you can measure that by using an oscilloscope, of course. Um, luckily for automotive, it's usually 500 kilobits per second, so you can also try that. And um, just as a disclaimer, there are also like uh, more, uh, um, yeah, more mo modern standards, um, like improvements on the CAN standards, for example, CAN FD. Um, and there you will also need to have the data rate, for example. Um, but let's assume standard can for now. And uh, then we already seen the canned up command. Um, I just want to walk very quickly through um, what you can see here. Um, that's one single message, message picked out. You see the, like the interface in the fr uh, front. If you um, have multiple uh, can interfaces connected, that's important. Then the can ID and um, the data length and the data. And um, the thing is, this can ID if you are used to IP, you're usually used to having like a source and a destination um, address. The can ID is actually neither. I think of it more like a publish subscribe topic. So it will uh, tell you how to define uh, or how to interpret the, um, the bits like in the data part. Um, also, it's the priority of the message. So the lower the ID, the higher the priority. Um, and this data, it can be really arbitrarily defined. The, um, the information in there is called signals, and it can be like one bit, it can be five bit, it can be all, uh, all eight uh, bytes. Um, so that's up to the manufacturer to define that, and that's why we usually uh, need some reverse engineering to make sense of this information. Okay, so if you, you might, um, uh, want to get started, but maybe you do not want to like remove all the plating of your car, and uh, it sounds very um, um, like a lot of work to figure out all the wiring and stuff. Um, so that's actually what we, how we started, but if you don't want to do that, there's also the way the garages do that. Um, so um, Janis already spoiled it, and that you have this um, OBD2 connector and for vehicle diagnostics. And uh, this connector is usually very conveniently located somewhere in the driver area of your vehicle um, in front, and um, you can just plug in a, um, a diagnostic connector there. It's usually an OBD2 dongle, which uh, connects via Bluetooth to a diagnostic device and uh, will read out uh, data like that. And the protocol to do this is called UDS, Unified Diagnostic Services, and um, it's basically a request response protocol the um, diagnostic tester will, for example, in our case, we want the steering wheel angle, so it will ask the ECU responsible for that. Um, can you give me the steering wheel angle? And it will respond with the correct value. So um, that's on top of the CAN protocol. It can also be IP, but, but um, usually CAN, and, uh, or both. And um, in between, there's actually an other protocol, which is called ISOTP and which allows to basically combine multiple CAN matches. They are limited to 8 byte um, um, to like one message in UDS, so you can uh, send longer uh, data. Um, but that comes with like 
the difference that now we also uh, we I told you, told you before that it's not like source and destination address to Kennedy, but for UDS it's basically the, uh, it's actually the destination address now. So there's also if you want to read data, there's also a data identifier which um, identifies which data it is. So you can have now multiple um, like different interpretations for data with the same kind of ID, and uh, data can be split over multiple count frames. Just watch out for that. All right, and with that, I think we should have everything ready to go. Yeah, I think so. We have considered the physical layer. We have considered the transfer to the software. We have uh, considered how we can interpret those CUN messages. So we have all together to create our game. And as a small in-between motivation, that's the actual result. Here you can see Tim sitting in our Volkswagen ID3. In front, we have placed a big monitor playing Need for Speed Most Wanted from 2008 with the actual car. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you can see a little bit more of our V2G experience. On left side, you can see our setup, a laptop where the game is actually running. In front of the car, we have placed a huge monitor for very immersive experience for the driver, but also for all other people inside the car. On, your, on the right side, you can see me playing uh, again Need for Speed Most Wanted, and you can see I'm very focused on this game. So uh, as I said, it's very immersive and it's a very cool experience sitting in such an equipped car. But how can we, can we now connect the laptop, the game, with the car? You can see on the right the topology again. And therefore, we have several possibilities to, to, con to connect the car. First, we can use wires. We can use the USB, uh, USB-based uh, PCAN Pro, for example, connecting as a one possibility to the internal CAN, uh, CAN bus. And therefore, we have to figure out which CAN bus relevant messages are located on. We have to find the relevant messages, uh, figuring out the relevant signals of the CAN, uh, CAN message, as Tim already explained, and there's a overwhelming number of CAN messages on this internal bus, as Tim said, several thousands per second. So it's quite difficult to figure this stuff out. Also, the whole breakout box stuff we've shown to you is required to get access to those internal buses. So the more convenient solution is connecting directly to the OBD2 port and use the diagnostic services for polling those informations and getting conveniently just the requested information. But since we live in 2024, wires are a little bit outdated. We have created a Raspberry Pi head, con uh, which allows us to emulate an uh, X Xbox uh, 360 controller with a Raspberry Pi Zero, connecting directly to the OBD2 port of the car. And this Raspberry Pi uh, connects via Bluetooth to the laptop, emulates this controller, and the laptop can stand outside the car and runs the game. There we use, for this setup, we use UDS. Now, a little bit into detail of the actual hardware we use for the, the lower layer of this, you can see it's a classical Raspberry Pi Zero with no modifications. Above that, we have located um, uh, uh, the Raspberry Pi CAN head, which is responsible for converting those physical CAN signals to a software-readable CAN message. And the top layer, uh, we have created a, uh, we have created a self-designed uh, PCB for connecting to this OBD2 port and for uh, for this OBD2 port of the car. This OBD2 port, for this, from this OBD2 port, we only use four connections, uh, the 12 volt, the ground, uh, the CAN high and CAN low connection. The CAN high and CAN low connection is directly transferred via this PCB to the uh, lowered uh, CAN head, of the, uh, which converts this message. But the more interesting part of this PCB is the 12 volt, 5 volt DC-DC conversion, so we can very conveniently connect this dongle to our car without the requirement for a power bank uh, and power supply of the Raspberry Pi. As a short disclaimer, we are non, uh, no electrical engineers, so if you have any recommendation about this, feel free to contact us. 
uh, we are quite happy about uh, recommendations. This circuit for 12 volt, 5 volt DC DC con uh, conversion is just taken out of the data sheet of the used uh, IC. Feel free to co uh, come off stage to us and discuss it with me. We have also added the possibility to add status LEDs, but that's to be done. Um, you can, uh, they are connected to the GPIO pins of the Raspberry Pi, so you can, if you want to extend the project, you can use them for your own purpose. So we have the hardware, now the software. Yeah, just, um, I'm just going very briefly over the, like the software architecture of our tool. So if you want to um, use it in the Bluetooth mode, that's like um, a Bluetooth controller, there's an install script for that. You just um, run it on your pre uh, image Raspberry Pi, and it will set up um, everything which is required. Um, if you don't want to do it, and just run it on your own laptop. There is a run script uh, for Linux. For Windows, you just um, directly run the Python protocol. Um, the run script actually will also set up the, some interfaces and stuff, um, but you can do this uh, beforehand if you do not want to execute it with pseudo privileges, because that's required for interface management. Um, then for emulating the game controller, for the Bluetooth version, we use the HitPy uh, project um, to emulate a Bluetooth hit device. And if you run it on your own laptop, we use the vGamePad library um, which is also uh, cross-platform, so it also runs on Windows. Um, so um, you can also use that. Um, for the Bluetooth one, it kind of doesn't really work on Windows so far. So if you have any recommendations on that, and I are an expert on hit devices, we um, also um, pull requests are welcome. Um, so now to our actual, like, um, um, yeah, the main components, we have a car detector. If you have multiple vehicles, as we have the ID3 and the Tesla, um, you can give it basically a list of CAN IDs, and it will figure out which car it is, and then um, use the according configuration. Um, the heart of our project is the car connector, which will use, um, like, convert all the, uh, the CAN signals in the messages uh, to triggers for the Xbox um, emulation. and um, then there is the vehicle configuration, which has all the vehicle-specific stuff in there. And um, I'll just um, have a more detailed look on that. So um, um, there you, will you can configure a name for your vehicle to reference it. Um, then you have to specify which operation mode, if you want to use the internal mode or the UDS mode. Um, sometimes you actually, if you have an older car, where there is no gateway in between the internal buses and the uh, OBD2 connector, you can also use the internal mode for that. Um, or if you install like the, the um, OBD2 um, adapter for the Tesla. Um, otherwise, for the UDS mode, you will also have what you can see uh, on the right side. Um, you will have to send those polling messages I talked about earlier. Basically, you can just paste them in here, and it will periodically send them um, to get the data. There's also um, an update interval. so. We usually we have a higher interval for like the steering angle and brakes, and for the buttons we use um, a lower update interval because there's a limit how fast the ECUs will respond. Um, also, we have some yeah, you can see the auto detect IDs I mentioned before, and also um, we have some like high level configuration stuff. For example, there's a, a we limit the steering because if you play a racing game and you have to like two times turn your, the wheel. To, for the maximum steering, it's just too slow, right? Um, and also, um, there is the steering dead zone, which basically um, you have a bit more space to uh, set your um, steering wheel to zero, because otherwise, if it's like 0 0.01 degrees and it will always go left in the menus or you just cannot drive uh, straight, um, yeah, it's, it's actually pretty hard to get your steering wheel to exactly zero degrees. So that's pretty handy. Um, I'll go a bit uh, into detail on the signal configuration later. Um, but for now, let's look at how it looks, works yeah. out. Yeah, we are ready to play. Unfortunately, we are not allowed to bring our car with us. So we have brought some videos of the gaming experience. You can see me here driving, uh, with filmed with a first person view, uh, playing a Super Tux card. You can see I control 
the racing car with the steering wheel, left and right. And now I've paused because you can see I put my foot on the brake. And see what happens next. As expected, the racing car brakes, uh, slows down and I was overtaken. Now you can see I've, uh, I've uh, started the indicator. We have mapped the indicator function for left to throwing items in this game. You can do this for your own purpose, for your own game, but we have mapped it like this. Mm. So you can see here, I'm throwing this exploding muffin to the, uh, uh, comp, uh, to the racing car in front of me, so it will explode. Unfortunately, because of PowerPoint is a little bit um, annoying, sometimes, uh, usually you should, you should see that I have turned on the full beam flash, uh, full beam uh, two, so um, we have mapped the full beam uh, trigger to the nitro activation in the game. So it's very cool driving in the night, igniting, and the car speeds up. See what happened? Yeah, yeah there you can see uh, the nitrogen. Now, you can see it's a little bit difficult to drive, especially with just one hand, um, but it is possible to, to race, it is possible to overtook enemies in this game, and it is also possible for you to get the right items, in this example, the uh, acceleration one, to win racing games. And it's actually a lot of fun, so. <laughs> you see, we're very excited about this. That's, uh, we, we're... So, maybe. Yeah, um, so the question uh, all of you are uh, probably have in your mind, how do you support your own car um, to use this? Well, um, before you get started on that, just um, um, make sure you keep in mind uh, the safety. So make sure you cannot accidentally drive into a wall, <laughs> right? Uh, because if you're in your garage and like you're really into your game and uh, by accident, you switch to drive mode. You, you don't want to do the tap and learn, even if, yeah, you're probably like hard on the gas, right? So um, make sure you cannot do that. Of course, there's less a problem on um, combustion engine vehicles where you do not have to um, like turn on the engine, but then make sure not to, to uh, drain your 12 volt battery, like playing all night. And yeah, that, that it's probably not good if you do not have like a charger. Um, uh, connected. Um, so what do you need? Um, I think we talked about everything of that. The Raspberry Pi, a can head. You can also um, use an, just an OBD2 open-ended cable if you do not want to uh, solder l your own um, OBD2 head. Um, so that all should be less than 50 bucks, I think, to get started. If you use the diagnostic one mode and you have to get a diagnostic tester to reverse engineer that, that really depends on the car, probably. There are sometimes some very cheap ones. And if you have to get a, like a garage level one, it's pretty expensive. So um, yeah, probably uh, too much. Um, OK. And then you can start reverse engineering. So here you can see the UDS tester setup, basically. Um, the actuator, we are looking at the steering wheel angle, as before. Um, we, here we have a, a tablet with like um, the uh, diagnostic tool, which reads out the steering angle. And here we have um, my laptop, which runs a CAN sniffer, which is a very convenient tool to uh, show you the differences in CAN messages. And um, what we'll do next is like turn the steering wheel to see where the information is. Um, and actually, I like turn it like one times um, completely to the left and one times to the right to get a min and maximum value, uh, which is possible for the signal, but you have seen where it is located. Um, and yeah, if you, sometimes you're lucky and you will find already like um, complete uh, CAN database files, those called DBC files online for your car. But then you can also try to get this information out of there and um, use that. But otherwise, reverse engineering of this data is quite good because um, it's like you can easily turn the steering wheel to see where it's, uh, the data is, right? It's just if there are 3,000 messages, it might be um, take you some time to find the right one. Then for um, configuring it, 
um, you basically add all this information, the CAN ID, the position in the signal, and the length of the uh, data. And then uh, that's why we use Python for the configuration. You can just um, um, use a function to um, specify the signal mapping. In this case, um, we have like the first byte is going to the le uh, turning to the left, the second to the right, and then we specify the min and max value and map this to a range of minus 1.0 to 1.0. All right, that's what you need to um, configure it for your own car. Um, so in conclusion of this talk, if anybody asks you, um, especially our professor, now you definitely know that V2G stands for vehicle to game. Um, and car hacking can be really fun. Um, and I think our project is a great entry point if you want to get into that or um, just want to um, yeah, say that, uh, can be able to say that you have like a very, very expensive game controller at home. Um, <laughs> always be careful if you do that stuff. Do not drive into walls. Um, we actually use it, as Janis said before, um, as a demonstrator to motivate students, to show it to visitors. It's always a good icebreaker to get um, like started about talking about automotive security. And so the only question that remains is what you're going to use it for. Yeah, feel free to contact us, do any contributions to our project, write us an email here, you can see the QR code. The Git repository is public, so you can, uh, draw, uh, can make an issue or do a pull request, feel free. We're happy uh, if we can keep in contact with you. And I think we have eight minutes left for questions, if there are any. Otherwise, um, we can also take further questions off stage. Have you thought about uh, playing with heads-up display? You know, that you can get these things now, you just put it on the dash and it'll, it'll actually just reflect your uh, uh, iPad or anything up onto the windscreen and it looks like a heads-up display kind of a uh, thing. Have you thought about that just for a way to project onto the screen? Um, so... Repeat the question. Oh yeah, so the question was if we have thought about like projecting the, um, the game basically onto the screen uh, of the car. So we thought about that, we haven't done it. We also thought about because the ID3 actually has a head-up display. Um, um, yeah, so I think um, there are adapters to, uh, to the protocol they use there and then you can uh, use it as an HDMI interface basically if you in plug in there. So we have some plans maybe for the future, but, uh, but we actually we haven't uh, done that or tested that. But yeah, also just uh, putting a projector in the back of the car, it, uh, it's, it's, it's probably quite good. Yeah. It's not a security related problem. It's just throwing money on it by a, such a con, uh, converter. And then you can easily connect your laptop with those internal screens of the car. That's expensive, but easily doable. Um, yeah, but, but um, come up with your own setup. I think there, there's a lot of possibility, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the question was how, if we uh, build up a flight simulator out, out of this, um, if you have a real airplane, maybe you can transfer this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, I don't know. <laughs> maybe you can use also your car for this. Uh, it should be possible. It's just an Xbox controller. Um, you can map it to anything you want. <laughs> okay. okay, any further questions? No? No. All right. No. Okay, thank so you. Thank you for listening and um, have a nice day. Enjoy the last day of DEF CON.